we see the threats. We see the obvious control mechanisms. But the greater picture of the spirit still eludes most. We can look around and we can identify a wolf with ease. But we can't necessarily identify the wolf that comes in sheep's clothing. Now, I usually don't do too much of this and talk about and tell, talk about my learning curve or my learning processes, but this one happened early on, probably the second or third Sukkot that I was at. And Prophet was there, and I mentored with him through this situation. But I was sitting around the fire with a, we had a, a, a main fire for the entire camp. And I could look and I could see the wolves walking around. I could see the wolves pacing. And I had a good conversation with, with him about that. And that started me on a journey on discerning. Because I didn't actually see the wolf, but I could see the spirit. I could see the prancing. I could see it all over. And I looked at him and he just looked at me. He, and I talked to him, but he looked at me like, you got that, eh? I'm like, that's what I got. And he said, okay. And we had a good conversation about that. But that started me on a path. But that's they come in sheep's clothing. I can see a wolf a mile away after 15 years of going through this and getting it honed and sometimes getting it sideways, sometimes getting it right, wrong. And then you start learning and you learn and you learn. In Matthew 7, 15, Beware of the false prophets. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they are hungry wolves. So what are we going to talk about with this? Domination. Domination. Again, we see the threats, we see the obvious, but the greater picture still eludes most when it comes to domination. Domination is used in, in homes, it's used in uh, church, it's used in business, it's used in jobs, it's used in military, but few people know the extent of domination and fewer people understand where domination originates from. When we get into the Webster's de de uh, definition of domination. It's about to rule, to exert the supreme determining or the guiding influence on. Exert the supreme determining or guiding influence on. It's about influence. Influencing people in a certain direction. Influencing people and exerting upon people supreme you have to or you're going to hell kind of attitude. But have we ever stopped and we look at that and it's easy to see with, with, with some people in the way they get into domination? But have we ever really stopped to look at domination from a biblical standpoint? And what we want to do is make people aware that domination, first of all, is not of God. It's not of God. It's not from God. And if it's not of God, and if it's not from God, it's got to be of some God to somebody. And what's that? Obviously, call Satan, the devil, whatever you'd like to name him, darkness. So when we get into domination, what God are you serving? What God are you serving? Genesis 2, 15, verse 17. Let's look at how God brought this, thing, this whole thing around and started, started life off for mankind. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see, in the, the 17th verse there, God did something that was very important at that point in time. 
He told Adam, you know, Adam, see that tree over there? You shouldn't eat of that one. You shouldn't eat of that tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. But he did not say, Adam, you can't eat of it. You could not eat of it. In fact, God goes on to tell Adam, if you ate of that tree, guess what's going to happen to you, Adam? You're going to die. So you got this tree, Adam. I wouldn't suggest you do this. I'm giving you real strong guidance here not to do it. And if you do, there's consequence. But at that point in time, Adam had a choice to make. Right from the very beginning of his relationship with God, God gave him the opportunity to make decisions for himself. And God gave Adam a, a free will, a free will to decide if he should eat of the tree or should he hearken unto the, the word of God. Shouldn't do that, Adam. And then we know also that, you know, Adam's wife, Eve, deceived by the serpent when she went on and partook of it. And then we know that Adam also partook of, uh, partook of it. We'll just call it the seed. We won't call it the, the fruit or the apple. But Adam didn't have to eat of that tree. And on the other hand, God didn't keep Adam from eating of that tree either, did he? God could have absolutely said in Scripture or said to Adam, Adam, I forbid you to eat of that tree. And I'm, I'm sure that Adam probably never would have eaten of it. God also could have done something else. God could have hidden that tree so it wasn't even an option. Why was that tree available? Because of choice. Choice. You see, our world would have been a lot different if God would not have given us the right to accept or to reject His Word. He gave us that right. He gave us that free will into that. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. One verse here. I have called heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your seed may live. This gives us further confirmation as we go through this of being able to choose. Choose. See, it's actually, this is what God is saying to Adam. Adam, you've got choices to make here. And God has given us the power of choice. He's given us the power of choice. Because if we receive Yeshua, who gives us eternal life, and by living according to God's word, we can have the blessings that are promised to his people. On the other hand, we can reject what Yeshua and everything that he stands for, because God has given free will to mankind. And that's a, a proven fact. That's not an assumption. That's a proven fact. Therefore, nobody has the right to supersede God. To supersede God and take away the right of choice by somebody. You see, that right of choice, or when that free will is taken, then domination has taken over. Domination has taken over. And that's what we have to avoid because not only are you trying to play God who didn't do that to, to Adam, you're taking it and trying to put darkness on top of the Father to control everything all the way from the top to the very bottom. In 1 Kings 16, 29 through 33, we're going to get into to Ahab. In the 13th year of Asa king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri became king over Israel. And Ahab, 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 the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that took his wife as Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. 
And Ahab made a wooden image, a wooden image, a grove, an Asherah, from a different, few different translations. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger, to anger more than all the kings of Israel who were before him. All of them combined. You see, in the 30, 30th verse here, it's evident that Ahab had made a choice to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. He made that choice. Instead of doing what? Instead of doing according to God's word. And Ahab also made another choice when he married Jezebel. God did not want his people to marry outside of the 12 tribes. It's part of the, part of the rules that God laid out. And he chose, because he had free will, he chose and he went outside of that. And he brought in a whole mess of problems. We can see other guys who have done that in scripture. Solomon for one. But he knew that Israel would, would conform. God knew that Israel would conform to the standards of the world. He knew that they, would, they wouldn't conform to him if they had all these choices. Go right back to the garden. I wouldn't do that if I were you because you're going to be in violation of my word. And mankind has always gone into that violation of God's word. And that's what exactly happened in this case, through what? His choices. You see here, she was the daughter of the king of the Zidonians, which was outside of the 12 tribes. He brought that in. Then you get into the 31st verse. They started serving Baal. They started worshiping Baal. And you can see how that started to come over and, and take over. In 1 Kings 18, 13. And then we'll go to 18, 19. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of, of the Lord? How I hid 100 men of the, Lord, the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with the bread and water? Do you think he had some responsibility and some, when, he, when he stands before God? Yeah, he's going to have to do some answering. He brought this in, and now she's out here doing all this stuff. Jezebel, because Jezebel, she had what? She had taken responsibility. She had taken responsibility about killing the prophets of God because she didn't want anybody coming against her God, Baal. And that's what they were doing. That's what prophets would do. They would come against her God. 18, 19. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table who eat at Jezebel's table. And I know there's a deeper read into that. There's a whole sermon built right into that right there. But Jezebel, here she is. She's feeding. She's taking care of 850 false prophets. So in other words, as long as these prophets did exactly as they were told by her, as long as they were serving these false gods, they were fed, they were kept alive, they were probably had a pretty decent life, probably ate really good food, but they were being fed and taken care of by who? By Jezebel. And they did according to what she said. She, they did everything that she wanted done. She had full domination and full control over them. And in doing that, they lost their free will. They lost their free will. They gave it up. And then you get into the, the right of choice their right of choice was altered by Jezebel. Again, we're talking about domination. And that word domination can absolutely be applied right here in this situation in which we're talking about. All choice was taken away. We look at, again, dominate, to rule, supreme, determining, or guiding influence on. To dominate is to rule. And that's exactly what Jezebel was doing. She was ruling. She was dominating these people. First Kings uh, 21. And see, we look in this whole chapter, and I suggest you go through and read that whole story. It's a, it's a pretty phenomenal story. It's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, actually. But you see that Ahab decided that he wanted Jezebel's d domination over Ahab. And it's best known, and we look through the situation between these two, Another scenario with this woman, 
how she's got this vineyard that she, her husband wants, that Ahab wants. And uh, Ahab goes and talks to Naboth. And Ahab offered him a you know, sum of money or a trade or whatever you'd like to, to call it. He offered him a better vineyard, but he didn't want to deal with it. He liked where he was. He liked what he had. He liked the asset. And then you jump down in 1 Kings 21.5, and you can see Jezebel wanted to know why Ahab was so sad. And then what happened? She makes a choice here. She makes a major decision. She decided that she would see to it that Ahab got his little heart's desire and she was going to do it regardless one way or another. It was going to happen. And she plotted against Naboth. And in the 13th, 13th, uh, 13th verse, it talks about there that he was stoned to death and he died. All because what? He had a choice to make and he chose not to sell it. Ahab sad and she come out flying. I'm going to do it regardless, regardless, 1 Kings 21, 25, but there was no one like Ahab who uh, sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Jezebel, his wife Jezebel stirred him up. Jezebel inspired Ahab to do wicked things, to do wickedness because she absolutely dominated him. And through that domination, she ran what would be known today as today's government. She ran the church. She ran the home. And he had absolutely no say in there. Now, let me interject here. It's only Je Jezebel's spirit if it's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility. Ephraim is part of the nation of Israel. Ephraim will run all of Israel once we get back to the land, our homeland. And that's where the prophetic side of it comes in. And they're going to be what? We are the government. The ten are the government of the nation of Israel. Get that through your thick skull. Because it's only Jezebel. It's only control mechanisms. If it's not your responsibility when you're accountable before God, when I'm accountable before God, I want to say, I want to say, it's no different than the home. Men, you're going to stand in front of God and you're going to give an account for everything that goes on in the home. And that's why you have to have a say in everything, whether it be the finances, the communication, the way the homes run, the way the kids are, are raised. You have to have a say because you're going to stand before God. Your wife's not going to be beside you. But this illustration shows us to be well aware of domination and its effect. Have you ever been, and I'm sure we've all seen it, we've all been around women who completely dominate every situation that comes up, no matter how complex or how simple you see them absolutely running their husbands and do this, do that. They control the entire world around them. They control every bubble of it. They try to control anything and everything that affects their bubble. Anything and everything. When they're not responsible. Again, men will be accountable. Ladies, you're going to be accountable for your own stuff. But it's the way that the Father set it up. And I'm not calling anybody Jezebel here. And I'm not calling anybody Ahab here. We're talking about domination because it's becoming more and more prevalent out here. It's becoming a bigger issue. It's snowballing. You can see sex of LGBTQ. They're so tolerant and they want tolerance, except when you disagree with them. And then what happens? They are the most intolerant people that are out there. One thing we were warned of with counseling, and I didn't get into other types of counseling. When people come to you, the one thing that they're always going to want, they're going to want you to agree with them. They're looking for somebody to agree with them. And that's one thing that you've always got to watch out for. 
And when you don't agree with them, that's when all hellfire and brimstone comes out of them. Why? It's the same thing. Be tolerant as long as it's what I want, what I see, what I need. But heaven forbid somebody have a different perspective or a right perspective. And then watch all hell go sideways. You see, we're not looking at this and trying to weaponize this to imply women are the only people that, that dominate. We're using that as an example. Men are also guilty of domination. We can also overstep boundaries. That's why we talked, you know, you take it into counseling. You don't cross that threshold and get into somebody's bedroom if it's marriage counseling and things. There's certain levels that you just leave alone because you don't dominate them. You present people with options and choice. It's just the way that God set it up. God brought woman on the scene. He put her in subjection to her husband, back to Adam and Eve again. And sometimes what? Sometimes women can get caught up into the, the things of domination. And I'm not talking about women walking two steps behind a man and like caveman mentality and drag her around. No, my wife walks with me. The two shall become one. I'm the one that has to make the final decisions though. I'm the one that has to stand in front of God and give an account for those decisions. So am I going to have a say in it? You're darn right I am. You're, I'm, you're darn right. But like I said, you know, my wife and I have certain arrangements that we have, and that would be, I'll use this again. The bills are all set up in the house, and she has full control to pay those bills when they need to be paid, it's just a systematic, and she just goes through it. It's, it's assigned, and she takes you know, great pride in that, and she does her job, and maybe she doesn't like it so much with that, but she gets to do that. She does that for us. I'm busy enough doing other things. We went through, we set it up years and years and years ago. That's just the way that we do it. It works. You can have your own arrangement. You can have your own way that things are set up. But, but we have to get past this tyrancy, guys. Sometimes we get, you know, pounding on them. You see, because how does this affect? How does this influence? Let me tell you, men. A man will be successful in whatever you want. It could be out here doing anything. You can be successful in everything out there, except for the things that really count in the eyes of the Father. You will never be successful, one, in the home, and you will never be successful in the church. You will never be in success if you're carrying that and you're being dominated. Because there's been a pattern. It's been a pattern for such a long time, hundreds of years. I'm not looking modern. It goes back. And that's the way it rolls through every situation. There's always going to be that problem until it's taken care of. You see, you're looking through women who were working in domination, and there's some real tyrants out there. I, had, I worked with some real tyrants at one point in time. But if you look back on them, they had mothers who were dominating. And then you can look back and you can see up and see where maybe their mothers were dominating at one point in time. Why? Because there is a transferal that can go with that. That's a spirit. Domination is a spirit. And that's from a female perspective. Can you see the tyrancy on the other side of it from the male perspective? Absolutely, it can work on the other side too. There's balance to the whole thing and balance to the way, way to get this done. But that sp spirit of domination can obviously be passed down from one generation to the next generation. And remember one thing. You are all more than capable of deliverance. Any type of domination, anything that we don't desire, anything that we don't need, anything that we think we should shed. So before you... Women say, well, why is he only talking about women? Well, let's go to some scripture and let's start talking about and showing you how, how men can dominate as well and they can get carried away with this whole thing. In Acts 8, 11 through 15, Simon the sorcerer, as we have learned to call him, had bewitched the people of Samaria. They bewitched the people of Samaria. What do you use? He used a type of sorcery. And this is where we examine these scriptures and we go through these scriptures. You can see that it was through witchcraft, through witchcraft, Simon the sorcerer actually dominated the whole city. 
He dominated the whole city. And God never wants His people dominated because God never brought domination in. And then you can see domination and witchcraft are very closely related. And this is where we ended last week talking about witchcraft. And this is how it flows into this one about domination and witchcraft being very closely related, tied at the hip. God does not dominate you, and therefore you cannot dominate other people. You cannot dominate other people. You look at Samuel 15, 23. You'll find an example here of, of rebellion and witchcraft. Again, how they're, they're closely related and tied at the hip. For rebellion is as, as the son of, son of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as in, uh, inequity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord he has also rejected you from being king. You know, it's not too difficult to look around sometimes and, and see domination from men, from women. But we look to, to this point in time and what we've brought forward out of this. Realize that domination and witchcraft are what they're portrayed over and over as we go through these teachings. Starting last week, we're not done with it. We're going to go through this for the next three or four weeks. Yeah, probably three weeks. And sometimes this stuff gets a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes a lot of things get exposed because we're talking about domination in the church. We're talking about how pastors can get into things of domination. When they overstep the things that they are not responsible for. That's where that kicks in. That's where that transition happens. That's where that, that point of that access rotates. And when you start opening that up and start exposing it, yeah, you're going to get some hate mails. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, as we wrap up here. Now, the Spirit expressly states that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, demons, that's why this stuff is so prevalent for today, because it talks about in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. You see, do you ever wonder how in these last days, the last days that we're living with, those who had known God or know God, know God's ways, how they could ever give in to seducing spirits, how they could ever give in to doctrines of devils. Do you ever look at that? Do you ever examine how things could get so far off track? You know how they get off track? Because we see the threats. We see the obvious control mechanisms but the greater picture still eludes most. We can identify the wolf with ease, but not the wolf that comes in sheep's clothing. And that's where we miss it. That's where it gets missed. And I hope that as you learn about this and get educated about this, that you will be able to see the slyness of darkness. And I've been hammering I haven't brought it up so much lately, but I went on a rant there for about a year about being astute, and I'm back on it. My wife is getting probably a little bit upset with me because I keep telling her one thing. This is a very astute life that we live. One wrong word, one wrong but, one wrong if, one wrong word in there, and it's misinterpreted. This is a very astute life we live. If this was the mafia, one wrong word, you would be dead. That's the, the, the way it's got to be approached. We have to be astute with this right through because there are things out there that are disguising themselves. There is witchcraft out there that is disguising itself. They come in sheep's clothing. To be continued next week, let's close in prayer.